Good morning, everybody. I'll make sure my sound is down so we don't get any weird echoing. Well, wait a minute for people to join. And yeah, Barbara, your craft a lunch. Do you see my desk? There's like a little bit of a sort of spot right here, but yeah. I had to move stuff to other tables in the room so that I could set up electronic equipment to do today's live because I couldn't, yeah, it was, my desk is a mess. And it's been a mess since this whole thing, apocalypse thing started. Hey, Kathy, how are you? I'm still drinking my morning coffee. wait for a few people to come. So I thought this morning we would start with doing a slow stitch. And of course, that's what all of this is. Um, I showed when we did a live test. Hey, Arabella's heart. Good morning. Um, I These are some of the slow stitches that I've done. I'll show you this one in a minute. Um, and these are done um, just by piecing things at random. Um, and um, just stitching. And then I've taken and put them to a piece of mounting board. Now, any of you who have done needlework um, know that, you know, they have these self-sticking mounting boards for you to put your needlework on. And so I've used those to stick my, some of my slow stitches too that I don't want to make into a quilt or a journal cover or something like that. And so, and then I put a label on the back and sign them. So this is one. And then... This is another one. I really wanted to do something that was lemon inspired. And these, again, these are just cutting and placing at random. I didn't use a pattern. I just started piecing them together. Got all the plants watered and ready for art. How about you? Yeah, I got, um, oh boy. So yeah, so I, um, <laughs> I edited, scheduled and loaded 22 videos yesterday. I think that's a record for me and my YouTube channel. Um, and then I didn't get anything else done yesterday. I just literally spent the whole day yesterday editing video. I barely got drawing or anything done. That, and that was just while the video was saving. Um, this morning before we went live, I had to schedule all the posts and um, do all the things, the daily writing and things I didn't do yesterday. So I've did, done all that. I even got another coat on a resin cup commission that I have before I hit the live button and managed to make a little bit more coffee. So it's, we're all good. Um, anyway, this is a lemon one I did. This is one of the first ones I did. I really like the way it turned out. I also did, um, this one. And again, this is without a pattern. I just randomly picked pieces Oh, in the, um, this one, the lemon. Yeah. The background on this one is an old piece of an old tattered quilt. So when you're working on these slow stitches, you can use anything for the background. I like something soft that's easy to stitch through. And then if I know I'm not going to use it for, like I said, a journal cover or something like that, then I'll put it on a piece of this mounting board. And I do put a label on the back. Um, with the idea that at some point, someday, you know, when we can get into the shop safely, I will uh, frame them. Maybe if I, I'm running out of wall space though. Um, and then I did this one and this is a piece of machine embroidery I did a while back. And then I used it as a focal point for this slow stitch. And again, I just randomly grabbed pieces and just started stitching them on. Now, then I took it a step further and I was talking in the test broadcast about how I had this journal page that I really like the painting. And I thought, I wonder if I could do that in a slow stitch. So if you're gonna try this, we're gonna do one today that's much simpler than this face um, because this face was really challenging. I like the way she turned out, but I should have chosen something a lot simpler for my first inspiration from a piece of my own artwork kind of a thing. Um, so this is the original painting. It's actually out of a journal, um, that I painted back in 2018, I believe. And this is the stitch from that painting. And we're going to, we're going to work on something like this.
Yeah, so my base, um, I, I like working on a wool felt, wool, felted wool, or pieces of old quilts, or if you're all following along with Ann Brooke Textile Artist, somebody, wanna, if there's some admins here, uh, maybe you guys can put the link to Ann Brooke's channel in the chat. Um, welcome, Lisa, Leslie, Margell. Good morning. Um, so I also like working working on um, uh, cotton. She calls it cotton wadding, cotton batting, this thin 100% cotton um, batting, or sometimes you can find it out of bamboo. I like the way it feels. It's really easy to stitch through um, or wool or the old quilt. Now you can get scrap packs of fabric on Etsy and or if you have some creative crafty friends who are into quilting and slow stitching, you can like trade scrap packs with them. You don't need big pieces of fabric for this. I know my desk looks crazy with fabric, um, but I mean, literally you could make something out of just these little tiny scraps that are in here. You don't need a whole bunch of fabric. Um, you certainly don't need like half yard cuts of anything. Even sometimes the fat quarters are too much. Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of us, Barbara, tossed a lot of stuff before we discovered slow stitching. Um, so this morning we're going to do one um, that's inspired by artwork. Again, artwork of my own. I cho pre-chose a few fabrics that are sort of in the right colors for us to work with. So at the beginning of this whole pandemic thing, let me try not to cover up the um, chat so I can read what's going on. Um, at the beginning of the whole pandemic thing, I did some kids art videos. I may still do a few more. We'll see. This is one of the paintings from the kids art video. And um, I did scan this painting. I think it's available in the Etsy store. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think maybe, maybe, I don't know. Um, I took that and I scanned it and I printed three copies. So whatever piece of artwork you're gonna do this from, you're gonna need three copies. Now, co we're gonna talk a little bit about copyright issues. So you wanna do a piece of artwork inspired by somebody's um, art, if it's your own, no worries. If it's mine and you've downloaded a piece of my artwork from the Etsy shop and you're gonna do a stitch from it that you're going to do a tutorial on and or you're gonna sell the piece, I'm okay with all of those things as long as you one, don't sell the original art and two, you mentioned that it's inspired by a piece, by a piece of art done by me. Now, I will be the first to tell you that's very generous. Most artists are not going to do that and they're not going to like it. So be very cautious about what you do and where you show it and all of that stuff. But if you have a piece of art that you're in really inspired by, maybe it's a photograph that you've taken. You can do this and scan the photograph. You're going to need three copies. So um, one, I mean, I have the original. So I can just go with that. But one copy would be reference, general reference. Now you can tell obviously that my printer was running out of ink, but for what we're doing, it doesn't matter. Good morning, Linda. Okay, so I'm gonna take one, one copy. And the first thing we're gonna do is look at one copy, the first copy, and you're gonna just look at the main shapes in the painting. I am gonna need to put these on because I am not young anymore. Yay, Darlene, good morning. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the main shapes of this painting and I'm gonna just start cutting it up. So I'm gonna cut the pot out. I did probably have too much coffee this morning, so you know, hands might be a little shaky. And this is literally how I did the face, only that face is really complicated, so it required a lot more pieces, which is why I don't remember, recommend, uh, recommend that you do that. Okay, then there's the dirt in the pot. Which is that little piece. 
And then there's the plant. which is inspired by a little succulent plant that's um, sitting in my kitchen window. Okay, so you're gonna need three copies because with the first copy, you're just gonna cut out your rough shapes. The second copy, you're gonna go through, you're gonna cut out more detailed shapes. The third copy is for reference. Um, you may be able to do this with two copies if that's what you want to try. You can cut out your fabric pieces out of these, place them on your background, and then cut them up further. That's up to you, but this is how I did, this is literally how I did the face. Yeah, you know what? I have to tell you all too, before we get too far into it, um, YouTube seems to be like, well, the whole world's on the internet right now, right? So YouTube seems to be um, crazy right now. Like it was hard, it, I had to refresh to go live. So I'm gonna cut this plant out a little bit further just because there's a lot of background space here and I don't necessarily want that when I cut my main um, plant piece of fabric. Some of it's going to be okay, but some of it I don't want. So I'm going to choose really quickly here, hopefully, what I want. If you all are used to doing collage and mixed media and our journal pages and that sort of thing. And like me, you started out, especially your YouTube journey, looking for our journaling videos. Um, then this should be a piece of cake because this is just collage, but with fabric. So all of those things that you know about collage as far as light and shadow and composition, they all apply to this. It's just that you're working with a different medium. You're working with fabric. So don't be intimidated by the fact that you're working with fabric that you have to get out a needle and thread there you'll be you'll see my stitches are not straight and even they're not perfect by any stretch I'm not about perfection I like the messy sort of folk artsy hand done look on a lot of things but especially on my stitching so I'm just quickly doing that and then that gives us our three main fabric pieces that we need for our composition without going into any detail, okay? So then the thing is to pick a background. So we'll put these to the side. Now I did pick out some wools. Now the original painting of course is on white watercolor paper. Um, but I really looked at this and thought how much more interesting would this be if the background wasn't white? And I think I know which one I'm gonna do, but I picked out these three pieces of wool. Um, and I really, really am intrigued by trying it on this one, this dark one. So I'm gonna get my background and then the first thing I'm gonna do is lay out my pa paper pieces on there and see. Yeah, I think I'm gonna like, you know why? Although this printed, cause I was running out of ink and blue, can you just picture the green plant against this brown background? Yeah, that's gonna be really good. I like that. So now we're gonna push this over here just a little bit. I'm gonna start picking fabric. So the first thing I wanna do is pick a fabric for my pot. And we'll talk about the laces and the shears in a minute. Um, I picked out a white cotton or off white cotton initially, and then I picked a white on white print. And then I have this little tiny piece of um, distressed muslin. I think actually we might use this for the dirt. I kind of really want to use the print, the white on white print. Can you all see that? I don't know if that's going to show up on camera, but it's just a little tiny, teeny tiny like floral print. I think I want to use that for the pot. 
So we are gonna take our pot piece and pin it to our fabric, just like you would any other sewing pattern. And fabric scissors, reading glasses. Now, when you slow stitch, you can't even throw these little pieces away because you might need them for something. <laughs> I have to warn you, it gets to be a problem where you like can't even throw the smallest of pieces away because it can at least be used uh, for stuffing in like a slow stitch pillow or something. And so, yeah, it becomes a problem. little tiny piece right here that doesn't want to, there we go. So you could just do it with like one or two copies, Barbara, and you could do this and cut your pot out, lay it on your fabric, and then you could go further and cut out the shadows. You could also not cut out the shadows and just wing it by looking at it and playing with your other fabrics or stitches. Okay, so that's our pot. Then we need to um, cut out our dirt, which I still think I want to use um, one of these little pieces of distressed muslin. Yeah, so Darlene, yeah, that's the problem is you start like you, <laughs> you start, yeah, you end up with a lot of little pieces of fabric. It's a, it's an issue, but you know, I mean, how many of us do mixed media and collage and we have bins and bins of images too. So you just have to know your limitations on that. So I have, uh, those of you who have seen my art room chatted with me before, know I have a sort of a bin system and in my art room and I have bins for certain things. And when that bin is full, I can't save anymore without purging or using up some stuff. And that's the way that I help keep myself in check. Now this piece here for the dirt is really little, so I'm not expecting it to be a perfect cut and that's fine. We're just, these pieces are just our base pieces and we're going to, probably not today, but when before we finish this piece, you'll be refining the shapes and, um, texture in the image with your stitches and or beads or buttons or yo-yos or something. So I just roughly cut out using that pattern piece, the dirt piece. And I'm gonna put it right here. You can see it hangs over, it's a little bit big. So let's trim that. Okay, and then I'm going to start pinning these pieces on. Before I cut out the plant piece. And then while I'm doing the pinning, I'm going to be thinking about which piece of green fabric do I want to use for the plant because I'm not exactly sure. We'll find out. Okay, now for the plant. Um, what do you all think? I think the blue one is too blue. Well, might also not be big enough. Green, LOL. Thanks, Leslie. Gee. 
I think the blue one is too, it's just barely big enough, but I do think it's too blue. Good morning, Laura. I think this, this green will work. So we're going to, cutting out this plant is gonna be a challenge. So let's see what we can do with that. Oh, or this one. I'm thinking if we do the dark in the background and then we do lighter on the, on the top, um, that would be a nice highlight. So again, pinning your pieces to your fabric. And this is about roughly cutting it out. It's not about, again, not about perfection. How many times am I gonna say that today? Probably a million. So just pin it enough that you think you have it secure enough to the fabric that you can um, get it cut out. My hands are shaky. I really shouldn't have had that extra cup of coffee this morning. But I'm going to drink it anyway. All right. You know, there was just something about working on this green. I, I am um, going to do another face, but I really wanted to do this little cactus. And I just really follow my instincts with working with the fabrics, or at least I try to. Now remember, we're taking inspiration from the photo. We're not looking to duplicate it exactly. So if I don't get these cuts exactly right, I'm not too worried about it. That's why I didn't put more pins in. Remember, if you're gonna start slow stitching, you need fabric scissors. You need scissors that haven't been and aren't gonna be used on paper. Paper dulls your scissors very quickly. Um, I have separate scissors that are on the table that people can just walk in and use for whatever they will, but they're not allowed to go into the sewing desk and grab those scissors. My favorite sewing scissors are actually medical scissors. I'll show you in a minute. Hey, Marion, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but the apocalypse has done two things. Made me um, start drinking more coffee and made me start, go back to having the occasional cocktail. <laughs> It's either that or I'm stitching a lot. I'm trying to do more stitching because that other stuff is not good for me and my blood pressure. Although there are days like today where I just can't help it. So this is um, the plant inspired that inspired this is one of those little succulent plants that has all the like fingers, almost like an aloe vera plant. Almost, one more, one more, one more. Yay, okay. So all these little tiny pieces, these make good what the costumers call cabbage. Um, you can use it to use it as stuffing in like some slow stitches. 
Like if you make a little slow stitch pillow or something. Yeah, that, that looks good. I like that. Okay, so then just position your plant how you want it on your, on your piece. And then again, we're going to put some pins. Hopefully you didn't hear, just hear that. <laughs> I know, Marion, I haven't done a live um, broadcast in th more than three years. So it's interesting getting back into the routine of things. So now, before we start any stitching, now we're going to get out more of our sheer things and like shiny things. I do have some more cotton here. Um, I have this lace that might be nice. So now we're going to veer off of the painting a little bit, which is this. And I think I want to add a little bit of this lace to the pot here. I can really picture that. So I'm going to just whack off a piece. Now this lace was distressed. I think I did this piece of lace before we moved to Oregon. So I think it's been a long time. I'm going to place it on the pot and then let's see, and then trim. I'm just eyeballing it before anybody asks. Okay. And then I'm going to move my pins. so that it holds down that background piece, but also that piece of lace I just stuck on there, like that. Then I'm gonna grab, now I have different kinds of like bluish green colors for the shadows on the pot. Now Darlene, who's in our chat right now, sent me a bag of this ice dyed cheesecloth. Darlene, this is like the best thing to a slow stitcher. I love it. And you sent me a whole bunch of different colors. And I do think this is what we're gonna use for the shadows on the pot. I do have this too, which is more like the original photo, um, but I think we're gonna just use this. Now, the reason for printing three of them is if you want, especially if you wanna do the stitch a couple of times, um, you wanna do it more than once, then you wanna save these pattern pieces and you wanna cut up another one of the copies to get some of the smaller pieces. So you would take, not those scissors, these scissors. And we would cut the pot out again. I wouldn't do this on the plant on this particular painting because it's too fiddly. You could, of course, um, especially like I said, if you're gonna do it a couple of times, the same one. Um, but then what you would wanna do is look for these shadows And yes, before somebody asks, this is what I did when I did the face. <laughs> I spent a lot of time cutting out pattern pieces and cutting out little tiny fiddly bits of fabric until I got it to where it was close to what I wanted it to be. And then I, what I didn't get in fabric, I added in stitches. But you know, when times are like they are right now and things are not exactly calm, you know what, turn up the music in your creative space. If you need to, because you have a, all the family is at home, put on some headphones and 
shut the door and just sit with your scissors and your fabric. And so now you have two pieces that are like the shadows on either side of the lower part of the pot. And I can also do it for the ones for the upper part of the pot. This is a really good technique too, if you're going to um, do this maybe from, maybe you're gonna do a loved one's face. Um, this is a really great way to do it and get the proportions right. So it sort of ends up resembling them at the end. So now we've got our shadow pieces and I really, really, really think I wanna use this piece from Darlene. Yeah, Darlene, I love this. And you know what? Normally I tell y'all don't send me happy mail if you don't, you know, unless you really, really want to because I already have a lot of stuff. But anybody who wants to send me something like this, you're welcome to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to just use this pattern as a guide. Those are the wrong scissors. I'm like, why aren't those cutting well? And I'm going to cut out a piece of this ice dyed cheesecloth. And then I'm going to put it right here. And the nice thing about the cheesecloth is, cloth is it's very thin and open weaved. So it's going to give you a little bit of the shadow without adding stitches. Um, and you can really manipulate it and pull it out and, and um, move it around. Right? Uh, uh, how to ice dye would be a great tutorial. Um, I, I'm going to have to look it up because I have no idea. Uh, that being said, I have been doing a lot of dyeing, but I've never ice dyed, so I don't know how that works. Okay, so here's the other piece. Oops. So we're going to get the. I'm going to hold this up to the camera in just a second. Again, moving um, the piece of cheesecloth around and manipulating it. And it combined with the little piece of lace that's under there is going to give it some good texture and interest. Because this isn't about duplicating the painting. It's about creating a piece inspired by the painting, which is the whole, that's the whole idea. Okay, so yeah, I was pulling fabrics yesterday and I ran across the little bag of ice dyed cheesecloth and immediately went, oh, I know what I'm using. You could, of course, pin this. I'm not going to, um, but you could definitely. If you're doing it out of a different kind of fabric, like cotton, you probably want to spend more time pinning it and um, cutting it out than I'm doing right now. So then I'm going to, of course, move my pin. I'm going to move the cheesecloth around till I get the tone and texture that I want on the pot and then pin it down again. If you're asking a question, I'm not looking at the chat at the moment. So I'll hang on one second. Nope, you're all good. All right. And we got one more piece. So when you start the, for me, I think this takes longer to pick the fabrics and manipulate the fabrics on the piece than, it, than for me than the actual stitching. And I honestly, this is exactly how I do it. I don't, I'm not leaving any steps for you out. I wouldn't do that. So again, like with the other side, I'm just manipulating it, moving it around, grab a pin, 
I'm you. Oh, question, Tina. Are you glue basting? No, I am using pins. Um, I, I do have glue basting glue, and you could definitely do that. Do this with basting glue. Um, if that if that's what floats your boat, but I'm using pins mostly. I think because I'm not. I, I'm constantly until I get the piece stitched. I'm moving things around, and I am manipulating the fabrics and the placement until that last minute and if you glue based then you know once you get it stuck on there it's kind of it's there i have i don't think oh yeah you can see it on camera my big blue ball of pins so that's how it, well, where are we that's how it looks right now let's see wait oh There we go. All right, so you can kind of see when you compare it, you can see where the inspirations come from. All right, and we haven't really done anything yet. <laughs> so I have these other pieces of green, including some more iced dyed cheesecloth. Um, I've got some basting tape and those other green fabrics that you saw. I did pull this gray satin ribbon and this other sort of gauzy blue fabric. I don't think that we're actually probably going to use them. I'm not feeling so inspired. Um, but that being said, this is a piece of ironed silk sari ribbon. And we're going to whack off some pieces of this. And we're going to cut some um, at an angle. So we have a point at one end. We're gonna cut it into two pieces and then end up hopefully with two pieces with points that we can then do this. Take that little piece of red off in there. Um, cut that. And then start layering fabrics over the green background cotton for our cactus plant. Um, again, for this part, I like to use more sheer fabrics. I like to see the background fabric. Because again, like with paint, or your collage, right? It's about layers and texture. So. I'm going to put a little bit of this silk sari ribbon on here. Like that. I don't think I'm going to go hog wild with it. I've got more of Darlene's ice dyed cheesecloth. She was so nice to send me rainbow colors. Have I said that enough times yet? <laughs> um, I'm going to cut off a piece. Okay. I'm going to cut it into a few pieces. And then we're going to do the same thing with this. I'm going to lay this on top of and near where I just put that other fabric. Oops. Okay, and so you just keep doing that until you get um, the look that you want on your um, plant. Now on this is a, what do they call these? Um, this is from a pack of quilting fabric. I think they call them a charm pack. They're already cut into like a six inch square and they're already, they're pinked around the edge. Can y'all see that? Um, which I normally don't mind, but I don't want it to be 
like that on this plant. So I'm going to cut the little edge off. And then again, we're going to cut it so that we have got a couple of different pieces that go to points. A really great way to build up your stash of slow stitching supplies is if you have some, you know, really great creative friends that maybe you can trade with, they're going to have a little bit of, you know, different kinds of scraps than you do. And um, it would be great um, to sort of trade little packs of fabric with them. We've done that in our art chat group. This is some of the basting tape. This is all vintage basting tape. Some of this is sent to me by Lisa Swank. Thank you, Lisa. Some may be from some of the other ladies in the group. I am really bad about not marking who sent me what. So if you sent me stuff and I'm, you see it on camera, thank you. Especially if I don't forget to say that it was from you. Don't be afraid to speak up and say, hey, I sent you that. So I'm gonna cut a few of these pieces. I'm just randomly cutting. If they don't end up working on this piece, I'm not too concerned about it because I can always use them in something else. In worst case, they become cabbage, so that's fine. I'm gonna cut this one in half because it seems kind of thick. Try to cut different lengths, let's see. Yeah, so the pink edges, yeah, definitely they could be alligator mouths if you're doing, yeah. Oh, I actually might not want that on there. Let's see. I might not want that on there either. See, I cut those up and then I don't think I want those on there. I think I like that just the way it is. Now the bottom here is all uneven. I'm not too concerned because when we do the stitching, we're going to cover that up. So what we do need to do is move some of the pins that I know that are under there. So I'm going to just hold the pieces down and then go on a pin hunt. There we go. I think there's only three. So we're going to stitch some of these down. I stitch some of these down. We're going to pin them down so they don't move too much. And then we're going to start stitching. Now I don't glue based because I glue based. Yeah, glue based because I stitch based. And I leave my basting stitches in. I don't take them out. So I use them as a way to add texture and color to my piece and help me define my shapes, which is why I don't glue based. But when I'm English paper piecing, I do glue based because you can't make those little hexagons. There's no other easy way to do it. And I'm all about easy. Did y'all forget I'm the lazy crafter? I've been gone too long from the lives, huh? So that's what we have to start with. What do y'all think? Okay, so we're gonna start with our basting and for the basting, the first thing I'm gonna do is gather um, some green threads. I've got a few different greens here that I could use for the basting. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to start with the green because these little pieces are fiddly. So I think that we're going to start um, by basting all of these down because they're going to like, that's going to be a problem if they move too much. So I've got my needles. Let's take a sip of coffee. 
Don't forget to um, like, share, and subscribe, if you will. Hit that little bell icon for notifications on more lives and other videos. We are in the midst of the 30 and 30 um, watercolor series here on the channel. And um, I just, I did 22 videos yesterday, filming, editing, loading, because we finished, I finished all the 30 and 30 paintings. The last couple don't actually turn out very well, in my opinion. <laughs> They're a little poopy, but you know, we did get it done. And some of the paintings actually turned out really well. Um, so that's all been done. Okay, coffee. Um, I wanted to show you, Barbara asked about glue basting. Um, when I do glue baste, I use this. This is a fabric glue pen by Soline. You can get them at Amazon if you, if you look up Soline uh, fabric glue. Um, and it's literally, it's like a glue stick like you would use for mixed media. Um, and it does work really well if you want a glue baste. All right, let's get started. I think I'm gonna start. Mm, I'm tempted to use this silk embroidery thread. Ah, silk buttonhole twist. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Maybe I have had too much coffee today. All right, so I think we are gonna use this. I'm gonna cut off a bunch. I'm going to take my beeswax because for so many reasons, but especially COVID, we shouldn't be sticking thread in our mouth that we got at the store recently, right? So I'm gonna use my beeswax. And I don't know if I said welcome to Aunt Beck. Linda, I think I got you. I'm so happy to see so many of you here. Okay, so I use, a, I prefer a long, large eyed needle for slow stitching. That's my preference. I have, um, I have some links I can share. I've shared them in my little art chat group. I have, but I have some links I can share for where to get um, needles. Um, the easiest place right now to get scrap fabric packs, needles, and stuff like that, if you can't find them on Amazon, is to honestly, is to go to Etsy. Go support your little uh, local Etsy shops. Now, before we stitch this down, I do think I'm going to do something. I'm going to take our little piece of dirt out from underneath. And I'm going to do this. Look what that does. So if we stitch the plants down first, and then we put the dirt, look at that. So we're gonna take our little piece of dirt out and I'm gonna just stitch the plants down. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sorry, that's something my husband says when I go, when I say that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna a lot. Um, I'm gonna move my little corner of my pot out of the way with a pin, not really moving too much except for the piece of dirt. And we're gonna just focus on stitching the plant down. Now we're just gonna do running stitches. Again, this is not anything you need to be intimidated by that you need to feel like I can't do that. It's not a fancy embroidery stitch, like literally, and you'll be able to see this because my, my thread is so light. So I'm gonna come up through the back. I did tie a knot in the thread. And it gets a little tough when you have so many layers of fabric. And sometimes the thread wants to wrap around a pin. So I'm gonna take that pin out. Now I use my basting stitches. Usually I do them in a closer color than we're using here, but I use the stitches um, as a way to suggest movement in my piece and texture in my piece. So um, since this plant, the real plant is very spiky and upright, then I want to um, have the stitches emphasize that. So at the end of that little branch, I'm gonna try to sew the tip down by going into the tip, go through the back. Then I'm gonna come back up again down here, pull it taut, but not too tight.
just running stitches. Those of you who've sewn before, this is just a running stitch. And you can see they're not straight. I'm not even trying to make them straight. I could if I wanted to, but I'm not going to. And then you wanna just keep doing that all the way across the plant until all or most of your little pieces are stitched down. And this is the part where I like to just turn on the music and just stitch, let everything go, all the craziness about the world situation if friends or family are kind of going nuts because they're not handling it well, first of all, you're not alone. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So I'm not going to, there's a piece right here that's loose. I'm going, I'll, I'll be going back to get that one and this one over here. But first I want to stitch enough of it down that I can get all the pins out. Oops. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Linda. Now, when I did the face, you'll see I really emphasized parts of the face with stitches and I, I put beads and there's a lot of things on here to help bring out the features of the face. So that's the kind of thing. This is just the first stage. And so you'll be adding more to it as you go along and we won't get it all done today. I'll be lucky today if we get the basting done. So on the plant, I would do the basting stitches this way on the pot because you want the pot to be suggestive of something that's partially rounded. I would follow the lines, these, these sort of semi-curved lines of the pot, like all the way down to get it stitched. My goal is to get this basted while we're live, FYI. Need more coffee. And when you have this many layers of fabric like we have up here in the plant, you want a really thick, sharp needle because it um, can be a little hard to get through all of the different layers of fabric. It's time for that pin to come out. It's in my way. So for those that don't know, I started my creative journey as a seamstress. Back in the day, I was a seamstress and fabric cutter for Chuck E. Cheese. I cut and made the robotic character bodies. To this day, I still hate fake fur, FYI. If you see me sewing with it, it's like there's something wrong because, yeah, that's not something I do. And that was a long time ago. Some things never leave you. I also used to make wedding dresses. Oh, this is something I learned from one of the costuming YouTubers. Um, and it's a little pin cushion with a stick on it and it sticks inside of my spool. Like right there, so it's like a um, so I can put my needles in it, and I can have a few needles out, and I don't have to constantly unthread the needle and put different color if I'm switching colors. That was a good tip. Yeah, I also don't sew for weddings anymore because you know when they call them bridezilla, they're really not kidding. If it's not bridezilla, it's bridesmaidzilla. So. Just FYI.
So it doesn't really take long, as you can see. I mean, you can get pretty far with this. Yeah, I, I crack up and cringe at the same time, Darlene, because I used to, um, yeah, I used to work with some people like that. Yeah, mother of the bride, bridezilla. I have a tendency to really, really, really not want to be that way. So I spend a lot of time with my daughter and son-in-law when they ask me something saying, well, whatever you guys want is fine, to the point where Apollyus gets really angry with me and says, I just want your opinion. <laughs> and I'm like, um, okay. Because, you know, it's not a, their life is not about me. It's about them. Okay, let's see. Let's start on this one. Oops. I, I think the choice of this background was a good one. I'm really, really enjoying um, this dark background for this piece. Now you will notice one thing about the fabrics that I cut out to put on here. Those of you who are proper quilters and seamstresses probably noticed it right away. I didn't bother finishing any of the edges, turning anything under, putting um, fray check, nothing. I don't care if they unravel, it gives the piece extra um texture it's fine you love the pot oh thank you let's see i have to lift my glasses up to see what you guys are writing it's hard to be a good mother-in-law i i'm trying hard i'm really trying hard because their life really really isn't about me but i do <laughs> I do get talked to by the son-in-law when I say too much, you know, whatever you guys want is fine. He, he doesn't, he's very analytical and he doesn't like that answer. So this little point right here doesn't want to stay up. So it's going to end up fraying, but that's okay because I'll end up putting some stitches up there, like maybe French knots or something. We're going to just keep going, keep, I don't know if you guys are going to find this part interesting. It's just a matter of stitching things down. Whoops. I always get to the point where I lose my thread. Hey, Laura. It's especially hard right now when you have... Um, family members that are doing things that they shouldn't be in the midst of the pandemic, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, so we're going to just keep basting things down. And again, I'm, you know, make sure when you do this, that you're happy with the color of the thread, the texture that the thread is giving it. Uh, for me, they don't have to be even or small because that's just, I'm using it to give texture and, and movement to the piece. Um, but if you really, okay, number one, if you really want them to hide more, then you probably want to use a color that's closer to the fabric and use a different color for each one of these. Um, or use thread that you're gonna take out when you're all of a sudden done. I don't wanna to have to like, hello, lazy crafter. I don't wanna to have to go back and take stuff out. Now I do like this vintage silk buttonhole twist, but it, it can be hard to find. Um, there is a couple of Etsy sellers that have some. Um, Lisa did find some silk cording they call it cording um on amazon and i think they have it at walmart too that's very 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 similar um for a lot less expensive than this stuff but it doesn't come in as many colors um lisa maybe you can pop a link up for that of course estate sales um and, and thrift stores for supplies in a normal world um, but if you don't feel like you can go out or nothing, if you're being closed back up again, like some parts of the U.S., 
Um, there are a lot of things available through Etsy, through Amazon and other things. And we will try to share links where we can with you. We have a page started over in my Facebook group, A Life of Art and Self-Expression uh, for suggested links. And if you guys want something similar in my creative year, let me know. We haven't done it over there yet, but we certainly can. That pib's got to go. It's totally in my way. We don't want to lose our little piece of dirt. Oh, good. Yeah, I mean, I always have little bins of leftover pieces around from other sewing projects, whether it's leftover from sewing masks or, you know, a mending project or something. And um, for a long time, I was like, why am I saving all these? What am I going to do with all of this? And then I discovered slow stitching. I'm like, aha. Because honestly, I used to, I, I, I kind of cringe when I think of all the ones I threw away. I missed a little piece of fabric here. Let's see if we can catch it. Oops. There we go. Just think of it as painting with fabric. Yeah, I try to keep my, when I disagree about something, I try to keep my opinions to myself, Leslie. I do get called on it sometimes, but. Yes, you, the, Linda, so all of my lives are always saved to rewatch. And I started a playlist for these new lives. There are a bunch of old ones that are still on my channel that are from when I used to do Watercolor Wednesday. Um, and we may be doing some live painting videos at some point right now, to be honest with you all, I am obsessed with stitching. Um, my friends who are here that are in um, the Facebook chats with me know, know that. Um, and I do still watercolor occasionally. Hello, we just did the 30 and 30. Um, and I will not stop watercoloring, but right now I'm really enjoying getting back to my sewing roots and stitching. And so, um, I think for the moment we'll be focused on that. And right now we'll be working on finishing this little piece um, in the next few broadcasts. So let's see if we, there we go. Right down here at the bottom, it's really thick. I have to pick it up. Walmart has more colors. Okay, that's good to know. Maybe you can throw up some links, uh, Lisa, or we can put some links over in the document over in a life of art and self-expression or um, something like that. When you're doing this, I am finding that, yes, I do have some regular sewing thread here. Here's a little tiny spool. Um, but I find most of the time I tend to be sort of a gorilla with my thread and want to pull hard or I'm pulling through a lot of um, different layers of fabric and the regular sewing thread, I tend to pop it. And I like um, um, working with quilting thread or buttonhole twist or something like that um, rather than another kind of thread. It's a little thicker. And if you get the silk one, it has this really pretty shiny, silky sheen. Oh, hey, Peg. How are you? We're doing good. We're just slow stitching. I figured out how to go live again. <laughs> You'd be proud of me. <laughs> So until you get everything sort of loosely basted down this way, um, things will move around a little bit and it'll be, it'll be a little frustrating. This is always the most frustrating part for me. So it'll be a little frustrating until you get things um, really stitched down really well. 
um, albeit however loosely. And my pieces always kind of get a little bit wrinkly. Um, I try not to, I try to control it a little bit, but at the end when I'm done, when all is said and done, I always give it a good steam press. Yeah, Amazon doesn't have as many colors and I am looking for a particular shade of gray um, that I've only been able to find in the vintage threads. I get stuck on these like tangents sometimes where I just get focused on the one thing and yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing I have trouble letting go of. I need to be able to get back into a fabric shop and take a little sample of the vintage color that I'm looking for into a shop and just stand there at their thread display. But that's not something easily done right now. Okay, so can you see on this part how that's adding movement and defining, already defining shapes to that? It's a crazy day. It's a crazy time. The world's gone completely insane. <laughs> That's all I can say to that. But we have our art, so we're good, right? We can stay in our art rooms. They tell us we can't go out. We're like, yeah, okay, and? <laughs> I got plenty of creative stuff to keep me busy. It is kind of sad that date night is going to the grocery store. I will say that. Oh, and before anybody asks, I did get asked this question um, the other day. I forget where about the wool. So the wool is from a um, Etsy seller. She sells wool packs um, in her Etsy shop. Uh, periodically. I don't know if she um, is a stitcher or I'm actually not completely sure, but she tends to have different kinds of wool packs in her shop and I buy them there. Okay, Laura, good luck with that. And it's a great time for intro introverts. Yeah, we do as much stuff just drive up or mail order or whatever as we can. But yeah, this is a crazy. I keep thinking the world can't get crazier, but the world keeps proving me wrong. So, you know, I got to stop saying that. Now, say you are want to try something like this, but you're like, I do not want to sit there stitching that. Why couldn't you use this idea of being inspired by a painting to um, do a, a paper collage or some kind of mixed media piece. I'd love to see what you all do with that, taking it out of the box and maybe not doing it in fabric at all. And if you do decide to do something inspired by today's broadcast, I would love to see you share it in the Facebook groups. Whoops, lost my thread again. That's how you know we're getting to the end. Um, I, YouTube has made me turn more into an extrovert than I am naturally wanting to be. It's not really in my nature, but because I do YouTube, I find that under certain situations, I can, um, turn on sort of those extrovert tendencies, especially if we start talking about art. No, oh, thanks, Peg. Yeah, you know, sewing is not for everybody, even when our hands did work. I, you know, my mom is a great example of that. You know, back in the day when she grew up, you know, women learned how to sew and cook and all of that stuff. My mom would rather be outside with her dogs, to be honest with you. She is not, you know, she knows how to do all that stuff, but she's like, yeah, it's not for me. She'd be the first one to tell you that. And that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. 
Oops. See, I need to. This piece just came off, so we're going to put that back on after I tie a knot here. Sometimes I don't leave myself enough room to tie a knot easily. There we go. Yeah, in fact, my mom told me recently in a Facebook message that she realizes I'm doing a lot of sewing. So she says, I have a whole cabinet full of stuff and the cabinet that you can have. I don't know what that means exactly, but <laughs> I guess at some point I'll find out. Okay, so we lost a little piece here, which I think was up here somewhere. If it wasn't, it's there now, and so that'll work. Okay, again, up through the back. Now, if you followed my recent stitching journeys, you know, generally speaking, my backs are usually pretty messy. My grandmother would be horrified. My dad's mom, she was um, a seamstress and um, she did tatting and all of that stuff. Anyway, she always said the back should be as neat and clean as the front. And I was always interested in making texture and combining colors um, and my backs are not clean. But in this case, that's okay because we're, we know we're going to use it for a wall hanging or we're going to put it on a journal cover or if you're doing Ann Brooks slow stitch book, you're going to hide it. See you later, Peg. And so we're not too concerned. Okay, so we have one more piece here, and then I'm going to go back and catch some of these little tips and things that I missed. Lost my thread again. This time I can't blame it on being too small. It's just me not keeping a hold of it. I don't like to tie it in a knot around the needle because then I have trouble getting it off the needle. I know some people that do that. There we go. Got it. Okay, I'm gonna catch this little piece over here. I'm gonna tie that off so I can move the thread without having a long piece of thread floating across the back. Okay, so we can see here we've got some ends that are not sewn down. And here, no, well, we can probably do one stitch there. And then we have this piece and this little piece. So let's do this one first.
Now, if you hear background sounds of like birds and stuff like that, I have all the windows here open upstairs and because it's a warm day and I do live next to the woods. So I don't know if you can hear the birds, but I can hear the birds. Okay. More tying off. Oops, pulled that a little too tight. Did you see that? Okay. Let's do like up here. Now I don't just use silk and um, buttonhole twist to do this or the other uh, quilting thread or regular buttonhole twist. I also have regular sewing thread here. I've got embroidery floss. Um, I have some wool threads in the drawer. I do like working with silk. I like how it feels in my hand. Lost my thread again. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, all of you old embroiderers and cross stitchers that, you know, kept all that stuff and you can't figure out why exactly you kept it, embroidery floss works great for this. And sometimes if I'm using embroidery floss in combined with like buttonhole twist or silk, but silk twist, um, I won't even sometimes separate the thread. I'll just use all six strands. Again, it gives texture. Mother lost tongue. There you go. I didn't even think of that. So because I have this big piece of silk twist on here, I don't necessarily want to throw it away. I'm not going to wind it back on the bottom bobbin, but now because I have this sort of pincushiony thing, I can just stick the needle in there. So that's our our plant. Now picking thread for the pot, and then we can put the dirt back. <clears throat> So this is some of the thread that Lisa found. This is a, another silk thread. And these, this only has 10 yards on it. These are vintage buttonhole twist. This has 140 yards. So, and it's, you know, it looks, it looks nearly identical in, in weight and texture. So we're going to try this. I have this color and this color, but I think I want to use the ecru. So we're going to try this one which this just came in. It may be a little bit thicker. It's not a whole lot though. Um, and I have one empty needle, huh? Except that that eye is too small for that thread. So let's get another needle out because I have no shortage of needles any more than I have a shortage of watercolors or thread spools. Cause you know, it's just not a thing around here. I do need to make a new needle case just for slow stitching because this only has my slow stitching needles in it and it's pretty full. Um, let's try. I like these gold eyed needles, some of which I got at Hobby Lobby. 
back when you could go to Hobby Lobby. Yeah, you know, if you're like me and all the different art supply purges that you did, you never really purged too much of your old sewing or needlework supplies for whatever reason. You couldn't figure out why exactly, but they just never got purged. Um, now you know why, because now you can use them for slow stitching. Okay, these spools just came in for me and I haven't used them yet. Um, so we'll give this a test, but this is the silk twist that Lisa found. Um, modern silk twist. Feels just like the old one. And again, with this pot, we're gonna follow this sort of semi-curved line all the way down. And while we're doing it, we'll stitch the pot down the, and the lace and the ice dyed cheesecloth and everything, which we have to move around because this one, this one moved. Maybe we'll start on this side because these little pieces don't want to stay. This might be a good part right here, Barbara, where you want to use glue basting, like on these little tiny pieces. Okay. So now again, we're going to go up through the back. Seems to sew just great, just FYI, Lisa. We'll follow that top line of the pot around. There we go. Now here's a tip for you all if you want to get into slow stitching. So, yeah, so Barbara, I like these really long but very sharp uh, needles for pushing through all of the fabric because it can be a little hard. And I do have bobbins out here somewhere. I'm sorry, thimbles. So, um, you know, sometimes you need to put a thimble on. Hey, Debbie. So here's a tip for you all if you want to add to your variety of fabrics to use for slow stitching. Um, other than trading with friends for packs of fabric, like maybe they have something that you're um, looking for um, and they can trade with you for something that maybe they're looking for. Um, so there are some online fabric so shops like Mood Fabrics where you can get swatches for $1.50 a swatch and their swatches are like four by six. So they're good sized swatches and you can add to your stash of fabrics that way. And maybe you're looking for laces and shears to do layering like we're doing here. Uh, maybe you're looking for silks um, to add to your stash, uh, but yeah. And if the site doesn't say that they do swatches, um, ask. Hey Debbie, did I say that already? Because it's, you know, one of those days and I've had way too much coffee. So the hardest thing about doing this basting part when you're doing these slow stitches for me is getting the thread wrapped around the pins. So again, I'm just following that line of the pot where it's sort of a semi-curved line. I'm not being super careful about my stitches being neat and even, but I do sort of want them to um, suggest the shape of the pot while stitching all the different layers of fabric down.
hope that pin can come out now. And we'll just do this and we'll go all the way down to the bottom of the pot. Again, for those that don't know, this is just a simple running stitch. It's nothing hard. It's nothing super precise. I'm, I'm not even trying to be very neat with it. If you're just joining us, don't forget to like and share and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, do state so in the chat. And if you're watching the replay of this, um, put something down in the comments below. But yeah, Mood Fabrics, I ordered some swatches from them recently um, and I was very pleased. Of course, like everything else right now, they didn't come super fast, but they did come and I was very pleased with the fabric choices. A dollar fifty for a swatch is not super cheap, but some of these fabrics are like twenty-five dollars and more a yard. So I was happy to get just a little swatch. So I'm going to move some of this ice dyed cheesecloth around so that when I am stitching, I'm st not only stitching it down, I'm stitching it down into the spot that I want it to be in. Lisa, this thread is stitching just great, this modern silk twist. I know they call it cording, but it, it stitches just like the vintage buttonhole twist. Okay, this little piece right here wants to like move around. So I'm gonna go back up here and I'm gonna just put a stitch in there. So that it stays. There we go. So just keep doing this until you get all the way down. And now, yeah, you get a lot more on the spool for your money with this more modern silk cording than you do the vintage buttonhole twist. I think the vintage twist when I've bought it has been uh, as much as five or $6 a spool and it's only 10 yards. And this um, silk cording uh, is, I think it was less than $10 for a spool for 140 yards. It does, again, it does so really well. Um, it's great for this, especially if like Barbara said, she's having trouble going through six layers of fabric. If you're having, you know, if you're doing this and you're going, you're like she and I, and you're going through a lot of fabric and you're really pulling and tugging on the thread, regular sewing thread, you could do it with that. And it wouldn't, it would be a lot more subtle and maybe that's what you want, but it would be a lot more challenging to not constantly break the thread, even if it's new, good quality thread. At least for me, it's, it's very challenging. You might have a different experience, but. Okay, almost, almost. And then we can sew our dirt on. So 
So who are some of your favorite slow stitchers out there? Um, favorite channels, maybe favorite, um, um, favorite channels for dyeing fabric without chemicals. So that's something I've been doing lately. If you've been following me on social media, I have been dyeing things with either old ink that I have or flowers or turmeric, which I got a really brilliant bright yellow. This is dyed with turmeric. This one is dyed with coffee. This one is dyed with camellia flowers. I did all those recently. I saw someone last night in a video dye with rose petals, which I might have to try. Okay, running out of thread, that's okay. Let's take the last of the pins out. So yeah, so this, this thread that Lisa found does, she's pointing out something very important. It does come in different sizes, different thicknesses, if you will. Um, what she and I have been ordering is the F, single F. Um, the more Fs in the size, the thicker the thread. I only ordered two colors to start. I ordered this one, which is extra, which is an off-white. And then I ordered this one, which says gray. It's very light gray. I'm actually looking for a gray that's this color, <laughs> which is... This is like my favorite color of gray thread. So. Okay, we're running out of thread, so I'm gonna tie this off. So yeah, Barbara, sometimes it's just about changing the sewing needle. Um, I tend to like a needle that's not too fat, but long and with a large eye, which you can't always find because they, you know, give you a long, large eyed needle, but it's like putting an awl through the stitchery, which is not necessarily what I want. I'm going to butcher the name completely. I know I will because it's a Japanese name and I have trouble with English most days. Um, but it's um, the, there's some, is it Shish, Shiseiko? The style of Japanese um, slow stitching. The needles for that, I've gotten some on Etsy and those seem to be really good needles. They have different lengths of needle, um, but the longer Shish, Shiseiko needles, it's a tough word for me to say, um, they seem to work really well. I'm going to read that in a minute. It's hard for me to see the chat right now with my, cause I've got my reading glasses on. Hang on. I see your all capital letters, Barb. Hold on. You know, this it's always the last part of your stitch that like gives you a hard time, isn't it? I'm not even like in a hurry or anything. Again, I could tie it in a like a little slip knot around the needle, but I really hate doing that. There we go.
Okay, almost done. And then we can do our, I'll check up on the um, chat and then we'll put our dirt back. Now I do find myself most of the time, not all the time. If you follow me on my mixed media and painting journey, you know, more often than not, I add words to my piece at some point. And I am finding more often than not with these slow stitches, I do the same thing. Um, and I have some words that are printed on fabric. Okay, there we go. So there's that, how we are right now. We need to put the dirt in, let's see. Auro fill does come in some really nice warm gray tones. It's probably too light for this though. Thank you, Kathy. Um, okay, yeah, send me a link later, Barbara, in our art chat on Facebook and I'll look it up. But yeah, I really, this is my favorite color of vintage silk buttonhole twist. This happens to be one by Coates and Clark, but there was a identical color that was made by Belding Corticelli. Cortis? I should be able to pronounce that one because that's Italian, but I can't. Um, and it's very similar to um, DMC Floss 535, which I don't have on the table at the moment because I think I've used up all of what was out here, um, which is the same color of gray. <laughs> um, I just, there's something about this color right now that I love. And I have a, a few spools of the vintage color, but they're only 10 yard spools. And you just, you can see the difference. This has 140 yards on it. So if I can find a color in this that's similar, um, I was hoping this one would be similar, but it's not, not even close. Uh, it's a great color. I will use it, but it's not even close. Um, and then Ecru is another color I use a lot of. So I knew, I knew this one would work. So it's just a matter of me saving up a little bit and, or trying a different kind of gray, bluey gray tone and seeing what I can find, I think. All right. So now we're going to add the dirt and here's our piece. I'm gonna put the dirt back in. We wanna put it that way. Now this is a piece of distressed muslin and there are stained, different kinds of stains on one side versus the other side, but I do think it fits that way better. I have a needle on here that I can see has my favorite gray, speaking of that gray thread, has my favorite gray color on it. So we are gonna use that. Now I think to sew this piece on, I think I'm gonna do seed stitch. And I do think what I'm gonna do, cause this piece is so tiny that I think we're gonna glue baste it. So again, this is just like a glue stick, only it's for fabric. Now you can use it on things that you're gonna wash and it does wash right out. I got it on Amazon before somebody asks. It's by Sew Line. Sew Line? Yeah. So, and it just, see, sticks. Thank you. Slow stitching is a very grounding process. So for me, especially right now in the tough times that we're having, I really need to do things that I don't have to think so much about, that I can just tune the world out, tune, put the music up, and I can just um, work. And it's not about perfection. It's not about struggling and being frustrated because I'm not following directions. Um, and I don't need to analyze everything I'm doing. Um, I can just start stitching and however it turns out is good. Kathy, you might need to go out and come back in again because people are chatting. They're not chatting a super lot, but they are chatting. Don't forget to um, share everybody. This broadcast is not going to be for everybody because it's a stitching broadcast. Like Peg said, it's, she, stitching is not her thing and that's fine. We will be doing some painting ones and other things, but right now I'm focused on stitching. All right, so now we're gonna take that favorite color of gray thread and we're gonna break with my own tradition a little bit. 
and I'm going to do a seed stitch. Now I am going to zoom in for you all a little bit. Let's see if I can do this on my computer. Hang on one second. Let's see if the, the YouTubes will let me. Let's open the camera app. Yes. Okay. And let's hit the plus button. Oh yeah, there we go. Look at that. There you go. So I am going to do a seed stitch. And this is just the first layer. So when you're doing this, if you're really, if you all you did was get things basted on and you're like, wow, I really like that. There, there's nothing that says you can't stop there. You don't have to add more to it. Okay, so we're gonna come up through the back on one end of this little piece that's supposed to be the dirt. I have my favorite gray color of thread here and I'm gonna just take one stitch like that. Then I'm gonna come up in a different spot and I'm gonna take another stitch and I'm gonna go in a different direction. So seed, seed stitch is just stitches in random directions. I just figured out a way to show you all. So seed stitch, we'll use a Crayola marker. So seed, when you do seed stitch, you may start with a stitch here, but instead of going here, you didn't do that. You went here and then 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 here. That's seed stitch. So we're gonna do that here for the dirt. which is normally not a stitch that I do in this basting part, but um, I really think that it will lend something to the dirt in this darker color. And the hardest part about seed stitching is just remembering to vary up the um, direction of your stitches. And again, when you have a little piece of fabric like this that you're putting on, um, sometimes that basting, uh, sewing basting glue is like the best thing on the planet because it would be hard to get pins in here. Not impossible but they'd totally be in your, in your way, especially if you decided you wanted to do this. And your, your little seed stitches can be as big or as small as you want them to be. There's no right way, there's no wrong way, there's only your way. How many times over the years have I told y'all that? Along with don't dig any holes to China with your paintbrush. <laughs> I think you're gonna be hearing that a lot in the 30 and 30 series. Just FYI. So then we're gonna stop at the end and go back through the back and tie it off. Trying to make sure I'm in camera uh, behind me, there we go. So that's our slow stitch piece for today, all basted. Now I could put a couple more stitches over here, but as I'm sewing things down, the loose bits of the ice dyed cheesecloth will get attached more and we'll be adding um, embroidery stitches and beads and things to the piece um, as we go. We will um, be working on that next time. I don't know how long have we been on. Yeah, an hour, hour and 45 minutes. I don't want to keep you all on too long to stitch it permanently. So I always start out with some form of running stitch 
or um, in this case for the dirt seed stitch. And then as I go and I add more stitches, um, I like to add bullion stitches, um, pistol stitch, cross stitch. Um, you can see some of that in this. I do running, uh, not running stitch, what do you call it? Back stitch. Um, her face here is outlined with um, a lot of bullion, bullion stitches. Um, there's a lot of cross stitches here in the background. I like adding cross stitches. Those are my, my favorites are French knots, pistol stitch, cross stitch, and bullion stitch, and along with back stitch occasionally. But you could do anything, whatever stitches you have that you think are going to work. I'm thinking on the plant on this, we might want to add some, some bullion stitches, like going across this way on some of the spikes. And maybe some cross stitch and back stitch on the pot. Um, yeah, let me get something that, hold on. Uh, is this one on? Nope. Yeah. Nope. Okay, there's a bunch of us in our art chat that recently bought a bunch of embroidery books, but this is the one I've been referring to, and I've had this one like for five million years, to be honest. Um, and it, I have a few of these for different subjects because they're pocket size. Um, and let's see. So I tend to use back stitch. Um, oh, I do use blanket stitch sometimes or buttonhole stitch, which is this one. Um, French knots. I tend to not use chain stitch because that chain stitch makes me crazy. Um, I don't know if bullion stitch is in here. Oh, yes, it is too. 35. This has like easy directions, like step by step. I've had this a long time. Here we go. So Barb, if you want to do a screenshot, that's bullion stitch. So the end result looks something like this. And it looks like a bunch of loops of thread wrapped around um, um, the main under part of the thread. Yeah, I can do a bullion stitch on a, a scrap of fabric. So, oh, that's going to be glary. Let's see. There we go. That's bullion stitch. So let me, let me, let's get a piece of scrap of fabric. Let's, um, I have some, I have a needle with some black thread. But there's probably just enough to do a bullion stitch. And let's get a little scrap of something. It's not like I don't have plenty of scraps laying around. Oops, here's some white fabric. It's left over from taking a shirt apart. Let's zoom in because, yeah, it's gonna be a thing. All right. So, bullion stitch. And you can make them as long or, sh or as short as you want. Lord, why did I take my glasses off? Yeah, there was too much glare on the book. So the book is called Embroidery and Crazy, Crazy, Crazy Quilt Stitch Tool by Judith Baker Montano. And it's a spiral bound little reference book. I've had it like a million years. Okay, so we're gonna come up through the bottom. Whoops, I need another knot. This is an open weave fabric that came out right out. All right. I'm doing this on white with black thread so you guys can see it hopefully. I'm gonna come up through the bottom. Then you're gonna decide how long do you want your bullying in stitch. I tend to do them so they're about, I don't know, half an inch long or so, but you can do them longer or shorter. You want a decent amount of thread on your needle and you wanna go back down into the fabric how long you want your finished bullion to be. And Brooke, by the way, has a tutorial on these on her channel, it's really good. You wanna come back up near where you went, it, uh, went up that first time where the knot is, like this. And 
Then you want to wrap. You don't want to, you want to just leave it just like this. You want to wrap your thread around the needle, pushing it down until the loops on the needle are about the same length as this space of fabric is over here. which is why you wanna have a lot of thread on your needle because otherwise it's not gonna work. It's gonna look funny, right? Then you want to hold those loops with one hand, push the needle up through the loops. And if you've wrapped them too tight, that might be a little challenging, there we go. Then pull it towards you and Pull it taut. Manipulate all your loops. Till they're neater. And then push it down, back down through the bottom. And tie it off. It's a beautiful stitch barb and it adds a lot to the finished piece to not only attaching the pieces of fabric to your work, but also adding a lot of texture and interest and you can um, um, add colors where you need it. Like in the case of the face, outline the face. I did. I could have done a better job with my loops, like, you know, making my loops neater, but you get the idea. And that's the finished stitch. And it is loose up under here. So it's like a, a loop of embroidery thread. And you can do a whole line of these. Like when I did the face, I don't know if you can see it on camera cause it's navy with black, but I lined her face with just rows of bullion stitch and also suggested her neck, her face and her eyebrows and some other, a few other things on her face with just the bullion stitch. So that's one of my favorite stitches, but a little book like this or some, there's a bunch of different embroidery books out there. Of course, um, this happens to be the, I mean, and I've ordered a few recently, but this happens to be the one that I've ordered. Um, I have had a long time. It has silk embroidery, um, silk ribbon embroidery stitches in it. It shows how to do here's seed stitch. Let's see how glary that is. Oh, there we go. Um, so it has a lot of different stitches in it, 180 stitches. Chain stitch, rosette stitch, like, uh, you know. So a reference book is good. For some reason, there's no embroidery stitch app. There's apps for everything else on the planet, but not embroidery stitches. Like that would be like too handy because then we all wouldn't need to worry about books except that for those of us who really love books. All right, I think that's it for today. Yeah, seed stitch, I really love seed stitch, bullion, again, so my favorites are running stitch, which is what we did most of the basting with, back stitch, seed stitch, cross stitch, pistol stitch, French knots and bullion stitch. Now I am the, gonna be the first one to tell you French knots over the years drove me crazy. Um, I watched a couple of Ann Brooks tutorials on French knots and went, aha. So um, yeah, I would go check her channel out. But yeah, we'll be working on this more on the next broadcast. Um, we'll be continuing with this little plant tutorial. And um, if there's something else that you guys would like to see in future broadcasts, I do think I'm going to try hard to do broadcasts once a week as I can and schedules allow. And so you guys let me know what you'd like to see. If you're a member of one of my Facebook art groups, A Life of Art and Self-Expression or My Creative Year, um, feel free to go over there. Please do share your work, ask questions, tag me in the post so I can make sure I don't miss it. And I will be posting uh, the schedule there when I do go live. Uh, if you uh, want to also, you can subscribe and of course hit the little bell icon for notifications.
All right. That's it, everybody. Don't forget to uh, like, share, and subscribe. Leave any questions, comments, or concerns if you wa are watching the pre-recorded one of these um, down below. Uh, check out the video description for ways to support the free content here in the uh, YouTube channel, but also in the Facebook art groups. And um, stay safe, stay healthy, stay creative, and go out and do something nice for yourself because you deserve it. Even if it's just going out and walking around the backyard to get some fresh air because that's all we can do right now. All right, that's it. Take some pictures of some plants and I'd love to see what you could do inspired by maybe a plant you've got around your, your yard. You're welcome. And thank you, Darlene, for the ice dyed cheesecloth. I love it. It's my, one of my favorite fabrics to stitch with. All right, that's it, everybody. See you later. Bye, guys.